Good afternoon. A very warm welcome and thank you for joining us in our live webinar, Rising to the Challenges of COVID-19 Pandemic in Asia, Part 2. Role of ultrasound and chest radiography in COVID-19. This webinar is organized by the College of Radiology Singapore, Academy of Medicine Singapore, together with Singapore Radiological Society in collaboration with GE Healthcare. I am Dr. Andrew Tan, current Vice President of the College of Radiology Singapore and a Senior Consultant at General Hospital, Changi General Hospital. I will be your chairperson for today. Before I begin, I just want to highlight a few housekeeping rules, which is currently reflected on the screen. All participants will be muted to enable speakers to present without interruption. And also please note, this webinar will be recorded. For local doctors, you get 1.5 if you you get one CME point if you attend the full one and a half hour session at the end of the event. Also, at the end of the presentation, there will be a Q and A session. If you have yet to submit your questions via email, you can send them in via the Q and A option during the webinar. Please note the Q and A button at the bottom of the screen. Today, we are pleased to have a panel of distinguished specialists who will share with us their expertise and insights into the topic. So without further ado, we shall now welcome our first speaker, Prof. Ha Yong Rok, Emergency Physician of Bandong Jaising Hospital in Sonam, South Korea. He is the immediate past president of the Society of Emergency and Critical Care Imaging Korea. He will deliver us the first lecture, COVID Imaging in the AME Setting, Experience from Korea. Prof. Ha, please. Thanks uh, for nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Ha uh, from Korea, uh, emergency physician working at Bundang Jason Hospital. Uh, I serve as a president uh, in Society of Emergency and Critical Care Imaging in Korea. Uh, I really appreciate uh, having me as a speaker uh, and give a chance to join this uh, great uh, seminar. Uh, my topic is uh, about COVID-19 imaging in the A&E setting, uh, experience from Korea. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about uh, the typical findings typical image findings of COVID-19 uh, because uh, uh, it's truly an uh, awkward situation for me to uh, describe the, uh, the typical findings in front of radiologists. Uh, so uh, rather uh, as an emergency physician, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about how our emergency department using the imaging in uh, under the uh, Korean specific situations. So uh, uh, before taking up the main subject, uh, first I I'd like to show. Uh, what happened uh, in Korea amid this uh, COVID-19 pandemic because uh, the action plan in emergency department is uh, highly related to the each country at each time. Uh, this shows the uh, confirmed cases of coronavirus uh, how spread in the world. Uh, in uh, late uh, February, uh, South Korea uh, had a second largest outbreak uh, next to China. And, sorry. And uh, soon after, uh, uh, the soon after, uh, many uh, European countries and United States surprised us. Right now, uh, uh, Korean situation is quite uh, stabilized. Uh, actually, uh, the uh, 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 yesterday, we uh, had uh, eight, uh, nine new cases, including eight uh, imported cases from overseas. That means uh, only one domestic uh, new uh, confirmed case we had yesterday. Yes, we uh, 
uh, were able to flatten the curve uh, earlier than uh, other countries. Uh, uh, I think uh, the, 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 there are uh, many measures uh, contribute to Korea's success to flatten the curve. Uh, many uh, broadcasting and newspapers uh, highlight that uh, measures include uh, massive testing and comprehensive contact tracing uh, and followed by uh, triage and treatment. Uh, in addition to social distancing, uh, government keep the public uh, informed with uh, full transparency. I think all of these factors uh, were key to uh, containment uh, and uh, mitigation of this uh, pandemic. Uh, behind that uh, successful measures, uh, we have said story uh, in 2015, uh, MERS outbreak uh, uh, took place. Uh, that time we had 186 cases uh, it, 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 it was the second largest outbreak in the world uh, uh, next to uh, Saudi Arabia, and we lost 38 uh, uh, patients. So we got a lesson learned from a MERS outbreak event. So many things have changed after this outbreak. So, uh, uh, government can approve a COVID-19 test kit under emergent, uh, urgent use licensing law, uh, which was developed uh, already in, uh, back in 2016. Uh, so uh, even uh, in mid-January, even before uh, uh, the fir first uh, confirmed cases of case in Korea, company start to develop a test. And uh, three weeks later, uh, first test uh, was, was approved for, for, for use. So, so far, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of tests uh, has been done aggressively. I think all uh, these uh, test kit uh, can, lead a massive uh, testing and also uh, contact tracing and it it, it, it lead uh, minimize uh, the spread of virus in Korea. And secondly, uh, in special situation, uh, the uh, epidemiological investigation using GPS data uh, uh, CCTV footage and uh, credit card transaction history uh, can be provided to uh, epi epidemi special epi epidemiological authorities. Uh, it is allowed by the law uh, for the sake of public uh, health care. Uh, on top of that, uh, recently government uh, made a much uh, effective uh, uh, system, which is COVID-19 smart management system. It, it, it allows uh, uh, contact tracing within 10 minutes automatically, uh, very effectively uh, identify the transmission route and place the, the infected, uh, infected. And uh, finally, uh, the uh, rapid triage and uh, isolation along to the severity and uh, proper treatment is a big role uh, to uh, containment this uh, infectious disease. Uh, for example, in my cases, uh, sent to the non-medical facility, uh, which is residential treatment center, uh, the uh, to uh, uh, to avoid uh, hospital uh, bed shortage and uh, prevent uh, spread of vi uh, virus uh, nationally, and uh, for the critical cases, uh, nationally designated hospital and some level one hospital take care of that. 
so uh, uh, along to the severity, uh, the patient uh, can be uh, effectively isolated uh, in each facility. So uh, most of other general hospitals outside the hot zone, uh, where uh, include Daegu and Gyeongsangbuk-do province, hardly find the COVID-19 cases. Uh, it's true. So, uh, we can uh, use ultrasound uh, in COVID-19 pneumonia. Actually, it has been uh, used in emergency department of many European countries and uh, Northern and Southern America for triage in the current epidemic, epidemiological milieu. Uh, I think they had to do a uh, bedside ultrasound uh, because uh, in, in the context of pandemic, uh, rapid case identification and classification of disease severity and correct treatment allocation is very important for increasing surge capacity. Uh, ultrasound findings of, of COVID-19 pneumonia include B lines, many uh, diffuse and bilateral uh, and separated, and also asymmetrical. Uh, plural line shows uh, irregularity or fragmented uh, shape. And also some uh, consolidation can be detected. Uh, I just tell you uh, about new named uh, sonographic sign, uh, which is light beam sign, light beam sign. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, you can see the light beam sign here. Uh, the, it shows B lines, alternating B lines on off, uh, on off uh, pattern along to the respiration. It could be the very uh, uh, acute uh, phase of GGO legend. Uh, so uh, the virtually reported uh, it, uh, most of uh, the COVID-19 pneumonia patients show these findings, but not yet it was not uh, uh, published. Uh, I have to say, uh, actually in Korea, uh, we, many emergency department uh, use a CAT scan instead of ultrasound. Actually, I'm a kind of ultrasound man, even me, uh, uh, even I uh, do, uh, do not use uh, ultrasound uh, in emergency department. Uh, uh, although uh, WHO recommend, uh, claimed uh, the only confirmatory test uh, for COVID-19 is uh, RT-PCR test, which is very high specific. Uh, CT can help in the assessment of severity, ruling out uh, the alternative diagnosis. But you know, uh, CAT scan uh, is higher sensitivity, but lower specificity. Uh, that's the thing. But uh, we, uh, in Korea, we use uh, CAT scan a lot. I will uh, talk about later. Uh, for example, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the way uh, of each hospital uh, cope against uh, COVID-19. This is COVID-19 protocol in my hospital. Uh, we place the X-ray room outside the uh, outside of emergency department, and uh, we check the uh, chest X-ray of all uh, visitors. Uh, if the X-ray looks uh, probably pneumonia. Patient, patient should go to the CAT scan, underwent CAT scan, and then uh, isolated to a uh, uh, negative pressurized uh, isolation room. Uh, so uh, CT reading by uh, radiologist uh, help emergency physician a lot to make a decision. So I, I'll give uh, some examples. Uh, this uh, 81 years old uh, male patients complain of intermittent chest pain without fever. Uh, this uh, chest x-ray prompt 
the physician to perform CAT scan, which show uh, which shows a uh, bilateral uh, GGO and crazy paving pattern. So the finally the patient was confirmed COVID nineteen pneumonia. Uh, look at this uh, uh, patient. This patient uh, was uh, having a, a hematologic malignancy, taking a, a Gleevec. Uh, he uh, has no epidemiological history, but as you can see, the the casket shows a bilateral uh, diffuse uh, GGO pattern. So uh, the at the time, ED physician swept with this uh, CAT scan, uh, but uh, radiologists make uh, help in uh, differential diagnosis like this. So finally, he confirmed uh, PCP uh, by using uh, bronchial lavage. So uh, the I think the role of radiologist uh, in emergency department is very uh, crucial. Uh, so we need uh, the excellent backup. Uh, we uh, conduct the national simple survey uh, in seven hospitals outside of the Hatjong. Hatjong is here, the uh, Daegu and uh, Gyeongsangbukdo province. Uh, it covers almost 70% uh, of confirmed cases in Korea. Anyway, uh, I uh, asked them how many uh, ED patients in uh, March of 2019 and 2020 each, uh, and how many uh, chest CT was ordered in March. Uh, of 2019 and 2020. So I realized uh, the, uh, in the endemic period, uh, the number of uh, patients in, uh, significantly decreased and uh, the, the percentage of chest city significantly increased. That means the uh, fewer, uh, we have fewer uh, emergency department patients. I think that is because of a uh, kind of medical uh, distancing, not social distancing. Uh, and uh, with small uh, number of uh, patients, we perform more uh, chest CT to protect the, uh, uh, the, the entry of uh, the COVID-19 patients. Uh, but su surprisingly, uh, only two COVID-19 patients were detected in seven emergency departments in this uh, pandemic period. So uh, it seems uh, this approach, uh, this uh, strategy is quite uh, resource consuming and uh, ineffective, but uh, the Korean doctor, uh, Korean uh, hospitals are desperate to uh, screen and uh, protect the hospital from uh, the COVID-19. That's uh, because of, again, uh, MERS uh, experience. We, uh, that time we had uh, 44% of uh, MERS cases were the patients who had been exposed in nosocomial transmission. So that's why we really care and desperately uh, try to uh, the block the patient, uh, any unexpected admission. So uh, now what? Uh, it's very difficult to answer, I think. There is no drug, no vaccine yet, uh, and we don't know when the second wave will come. And uh, we don't know until when. ED should pay attention to it. To it. Uh, we don't know when we can get back to normal. 
So actually, uh, nowadays, uh, all of us know uh, we are not going back to normal. OK? Uh, back to the uh, uh, early uh, April, uh, we was very concerned uh, because uh, after outbreak of Daegu and Gyeongsangbukdo uh, area, the COVID-19 cases uh, in metropolitan metropolitan area are increasing uh, little by little. So local infections cannot uh, totally uh, eliminate it. And another thing is uh, the imported cases. Uh, if you take uh, take a look at this, uh, in this period, in this period, uh, from uh, late of uh, March to early April in Korea, the among the uh, uh, confirmed cases on the period, uh, almost half of them are imported cases from overseas. So we uh, we haven't yet uh, locked down the uh, entry uh, from overseas. So we can guess uh, more uh, imported case we will get. So uh, this is final uh, slide. We don't know uh, when the second wave uh, started start right so uh, the epi uh, epidemiologic experts uh, say uh, we should uh, we must uh, prepare for the several cycles of suppress, suppress and lift uh, policy uh, during these cycles uh, the, the 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 restriction uh, restriction is applied and uh, relaxed and applied again and relaxed again. So we need to uh, prepare for that cycles. Uh, so in this valuable period between two curves, uh, well, we have a very small number of uh, the, uh, the, the COVID-19 new cases. So, uh, in this valuable period, we need to prepare a lot. So uh, I am sure the government will prepare uh, about this. Uh, we need to establish national surveillance system, okay? And uh, we need to uh, build up new hardware for uh, the new normal uh, in healthcare system such as uh, make a safe hospital, uh, which discriminate the, uh, uh, the lines between uh, infectious disease and non-infectious disease, uh, and uh, specialized respiratory clinic. And uh, also uh, the government can uh, try to make a specialized infectious disease, uh, hospital and isolation units, to increase uh, surge capacity. So far, uh, uh, Korea uh, seemed to uh, successfully uh, flatten the curve and uh, the uh, stabilized, uh, but we should prepare. We, we should brace for the second uh, wave. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Ha, for sharing Korea's stories, especially the success story. It gives uh, countries trying to do the same thing of flattening the curve much confidence uh, with uh, extensive testing and, and uh, contact tracing. And also, thank you for sharing about the uh, imaging uh, methods used to uh, reduce emission of uh, positive cases. Um, okay, before we go to the next speaker, uh, if any of you have joined later, there will be a Q&A session at the end of all the presentations. Please send your questions via the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen during the webinar. 
So without further ado, let us invite our second speaker, Prof. Wang Xiaoting, Deputy Director of the Department of Critical Care Medicine at Peking Union Medical College Hospital. He will deliver a lecture on COVID imaging in an ICU setting, experience from China. Prof. Wang, please. Okay. It's my honor to take a lecture for, for COVID-19, uh, especially critical unit patients. Just now, I, 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 um, I, I thank, uh, take a lot of thanks for the career professor, my, my old friend, take a great lecture about COVID-19 in COVID uh, Korea. Uh, but there's a lot of the same, the same problem, same question for everyone, especially ICU doctor and the emergency uh, doctor and a lot of practitioners in the fighting, maybe the fighting per, per frontier of the COVID-19. So there's my, 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 my lecture, my experience about the COVID-19 ICU. Imagine application, imagine application and, uh, oh, sorry. Imagine a on a appearance here in China. Uh, as we all know, there's two uh, two important person, maybe a VIP person. It's a very a very important patient, uh, just like the uh, Prime Minister of Kingdom. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, Johnson. He got uh, he got a COVID-19 pneumonia, uh, but his uh, his famous his famous uh, sentence is, is, uh, is very exciting for everyone. Uh, he said, "Together we will overcome this challenge, as we have overcome so many challenges in the past." And uh, he said, said, "We will win." It's the first uh, famous sentence. And uh, another famous sentence um, from the Italian doctor, Italian ICU doctor, a uh, famous ICU doctor named uh, uh, Gattinoni. He said. Uh, in the in the whole in the whole process of fighting the COVID-19, uh, he said we in the past we will follow the protocol, follow the guideline. But this time, maybe in the future, we based based we follow the based on the guideline and the protocol, and maybe follow the physiology and the pan and the pathology. Maybe the panther physiology is very important, especially in this epidemic of COVID-19. So, uh, how about COVID-19, uh, uh, especially critically, Yonis, critically, uh, COVID-19? Uh, I, uh, as well know, uh, there's uh, three features of the of the critical uh, clinical manifestation of COVID-19 patients. Uh, just like uh, the first one is a continuous uh, aggravation of a pulmonary lesion and uh, injury after why wider invasion, and uh, Second one is early onset of severe respiratory failure. And the last one, last but not least, the secondary condition of circulatory deteriorate and multiple organ injury. Uh, just like uh, what the Professor Yong uh, mentioned about the emergency patient, maybe there's a lot of others, uh, maybe different signs and different symptoms, but there's the three main, main clinical manifestation. Uh, maybe we have some time to discover, discuss of, the, of this. So, uh, because lung is the key, the key organ of oxygen transport. So if the lung injury becomes severe and severe, and patient's clinical manifestation become severe and severe, and then the other organs, including heart and the others, kidney, maybe someone or something else, some uh, uh, key uh, organ, maybe become the function and the injury and become severe and severe. So it's a key, it's a key, key point of the clinical manifestation of COVID-19. And there, today, I will, I will emphasize the Imagine application in management of critical illness in COVID-19 patients. Um, as we all know, 
uh, in the early diagnosis of COVID-19 and the early recogn recognition of clinical illness and uh, evaluation and monitoring the, the critical illness and then guide treatment and interventions about the COVID-19, especially critical critical COVID-19 critical COVID patients. There's lots of imaging application, just like uh, CT scan and X-ray uh, scan and then critical ultrasound. But I, I want to see thin slim CT scan and uh, long ultrasound and echocardiography is the three keystone for the uh, critical illness in COVID-19 patients. So the first one. Imagine this application of lung in COVID-19 patients is the, in the very beginning and in the, in the whole process of the, of, the, of the diagnosis and the treating of the COVID, critical COVID-19 patients. Uh, the first one is in-depth emphasize the lung injury of COVID-19 primary and how to, how to differentiate primary and secondary injury based on pathology. And then we maybe maybe discuss something about the comparing CT scan and the lung ultrasound. In the very beginning, we will in depth in depth um, in depth knowledge know maybe understanding the pathology and the physiology of virus and the bacteria pneumonia, uh, sepsis injury, sepsis lung injury. In the uh, first one is bacteria sepsis. I think uh, target cell. Is the, the target cell is the intestinal and those and then rapid long intestinal excitation infiltration and then alveolar excitation got okay, important got a severe clinical festation clinical septum and so on just like a hypoxemia dyspnea and then if if we make some the intervention for the patient just like uh, improper respiratory and uh, circulatory in intervention and based on the source of a normal reaction of organism of the body the patient uh, got severe secondary lung injury main epicellular and uh, secondary endocellular and the patient got a, a, a classical uh, manifestation about uh, just like uh, gravity dependence change of lung. So in the whole process of, of this disease, the, the patient is from the, the sick sick to the sickest, and then patient, uh, the circulation factor is, of, is obvious and obvious. And the second one, just like COVID-19, it's COVID-19 pneumonia to COVID-19 pneumonia combined with ARDS. It's a wider, invite the uh, alveolar uh, epicellular cells, the target cell, and then rapid alveolar, alveolar uh, excitation and the processing pulmonary intestinal excitation. And then patient got uh, severe clinical manifestation, including severe hypoxia and severe dyspnea. And then patient got some, uh, got some intervention Maybe it's it's, a, it's a respiratory and circulatory improper intervention, and then based on abnormal reaction of and uh, of organism, so second lung injury becomes severe and severe. Main, mainly endocellular injury and the secondary epicellular injury. In the last stage, patient got a gravity dependent change of lung, so. The role of circulatory gradually appearance in the because in the very beginning there's a, a little uh, endocellular cell cells patient got uh, got a decrease and got uh, maybe a mild uh, mild infiltration but in the last in the last situation uh, with the progression of the disease the infiltration become become severe and severe so in the last stage. We, we can see gravity dependent change of the lung. So maybe it's a high hypothesis, but in the patients with my experience, maybe it's really, okay? In the very beginning, in the very beginning, in the early stage of, 
of the COVID-19, the pathology indicates that about uh, alveolar epicellular injury. You can see atrophy and the shedding of uh, alveolar epicellular. And uh, you can see type 2 pulmonary cell uh, and uh, hyperplasia. And then you can see suspected viral inclusion. So you can see the progressive stage of the pathology of COVID-19 patients. You can see lots of diffuse intravirular hemorrhage and uh, partial alveolar wall rupture and uh, alveolar fusion. So you can see, you can see lots of uh, capillary, capillary endocellular cell injury. So, so in COVID-19 patients, capillary endocellular cell injury is the primary. And then, and then, alveolar, alveolar epicellular cell injury is in the very beginning. So, so the primary plus in, in secondary, maybe, uh, maybe plus one, one plus one, it's the key, it's the key point of the lung injury of in COVID-19 patients. And uh, just, uh, just uh, this slide tell us, primary injury and the secondary injury. The first one in the very beginning, primary virus injury, and then secondary compensatory, com compensatory injury, and then secondary therapeutic injury. Especially we will pay more attention to the secondary compensatory injury. It's a, it's a, it's a have a very, very special, special point. It's respiratory driver will become strong and strong, and then, uh, and uh, and um, and in combination with in, com in combination with uh, sympathetic overactivation, you can see lots of uh, maybe maybe respiratory respiratory effort, but, and then microcirculation and cellular injury, and then you can see hyperdynamic heart higher CO, and then patient got a severe secondary injury of the lung. It's a key point. Just like this slide tells us, uh, self-inflicted lung injury becomes uh, become the important play an uh, important role in the lung injury of the of the COVID-19 patient the pneumonia. Maybe uh, maybe then ARDS. Just like this, you can see the epithelial cell injury and then in test tissue and edema and uh, high high uh, high volume. A membrane become become thickened and then impaired against exchange mechanics and there increased respiratory failure uh, driver and a high respiratory driver and then a respiratory effect effort then then you can got lots of uh, two key points the one is uh, transpulmonary pressure become increased and the transvascular pressure increase and then from the initial lung injury to secondary uh, lung injury, maybe uh, combined primary and uh, secondary lung injury and become severe and severe. So it's a key point. And then I, I, I take, a, we, we um, published a paper in ICM, uh, findings of lung ultrasound of no uh, corona virus pneumonia. And then we can see uh, lots of uh, the characteristic, uh, characteristic of lung ultrasound, uh, like uh, the second uh, pleural line and uh, B line, uh, confluent, uh, con confluent B lines, small consolidation, the both non translobal and the translobal consolidation, and the pleural effusion is rare. And then you can see lots of uh, multiple, uh, multiple low barrier distribution of uh, abnormalities. And then, just like uh, this slide tells us um, it's a primary injury of the of the COVID-19 lung. It's a primary injury. You like the, the first one? Look the ground glass shadow. Maybe maybe single. Maybe maybe multiple. And then and then become large area multiple ground glass shadow. Just just like what the professor Holmes tells us. And then you can see large infiltration shadow and a massive exceeded shadow. And you can see almost, uh, uh, almost uh, consolidation, but, but non-gravity dependent. It's a primary, primary injury. And then, and then you can some, see can some the other primary injury, just like uh, a little, a little small consolidation and including some area bronchial sign and some some small, 
there's a small inflatory noodles. It's just like a, a long or strong the tell us it's a shredded side. It's the totals of what I mentioned about the two slides tell us it's the primary injury. And then secondary injury. You can see two important, uh, two important uh, uh, findings. It's the first one is uh, just like a white lung. Long after strong the sign tell us it's a white lung. Totally, every every area, every everywhere of the lung is B line. But it's uh, the, the the CT scan, the thin slide CT scan tell us it's a diffuse infiltration. But the the characteristics, the key point is mm, tendency of grand gravity dependence. The, it's very very obvious. So it's uh, it's not the primary injury. Maybe it's uh, it's uh, secondary in, secondary injury. But let us take a look. What's the classical uh, classical secondary injury? Just like a consolidation, it's gravity dependence. And then we we take, we we, take, we named it a classical ARDS. The core uh, ARDS, a classical ARDS. The core is a secondary injury. And the secondary injury is the core in classical ARDS, just like what the what the, what the lung out strong and what the CT scan tell us. It's a gravity dependency, but lung out strong tell us it's a A line, B line, and consolidation combination in one lung out strong examination. So it's a lung out strong. In the uh, last one, I will tell tell everyone it's uh, fibrosis. Maybe it's uh, it's uh, early or later onset. Just like uh, uh, the, the CT scan tell us, it's a uh, focal fibrosis and then extensive fibrosis, and it's, um, some some patients tell us it's uh, diffuse fibrosis. Just like uh, the 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 lung ultrasound tell us it's uh, irregular pleural thickening and unequal bilan spacing and varied distribution. But I emphasize, uh, tell, emphasize that fibrosis is onset in the whole process of the COVID-19 patient's uh, lung injury. But late, late onset is often and obvious, especially the fibrosis. So this slides give uh, a little summarization of the lung ultrasound and the six uh, and the CT scan comparison. So you can see, you can see the lung ultrasound sign from the GGO exciting infiltration to the consolidation to the fibrosis. It's the CT scan. But the lung ultrasound based on the based on the CT scan tell us CT scan sign, and we give lots of lung ultrasound signs just as, just like in the very beginning from the smooth pleural to thickening in constitution and restricted movements and to B line, A line, and then to shader sign, tissue sign, diffuse, diffuse tissue sign and consolidation, and then to the fibrosis, just like the focal irregular B line and the diffuse irregular B line. And based on the pleural, pleural line is very, very changed. And then, uh, in, and then we will tell some about the imagine application of heart in COVID-19 patients. Uh, we, we need to pay more attention to the heart features based on lung injury series, the critical COVID-19 case. Just like this slide tell us, um, we take a echocardiography examination for the COVID-19 patients, especially the critical COVID-19 patient, it's necessary and mandatory because heart is an important part of oxygen transport and especially combined with lung. Patient got, got a severe manifestation, just like a hypoxia and a respiratory distress, and maybe combined with bacterial sepsis, maybe uh, acute uh, myocardial infarction. Heart attack is always exist in the whole process of COVID-19 patients, pneumonia and ARDS. So I think uh, because uh, heart attacks always uh, exist, uh, maybe there's a lot of reasons, but we will, we will emphasize 
echocardiography examination for these patients is necessary and mandatory. We published, uh, published a paper in the critical care and they tell us using, tell everyone using echocardiography to guide the treatment of, of the NCP patients, maybe uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pneumonia patients. We can see lots of uh, echocardiography features of uh, uh, features of a COVID-19 patient, just like uh, hyperdynamic uh, and uh, acute uh, stress-induced uh, cardiomyopathy and the right ventricle enlarged and the uh, acute pulmonary hypertension and then diffuse myo myo myocardial inhaler patient. Maybe the first one, just like this one, you can see this patient got large uh, injury about, uh, lung injury about the lung area, multiple ground GGO, and then the lung ultrasound tells us it's a local B lines. And then patients got a uh, hypoxia and uh, a respiratory distress. Maybe the, the heart indicate manifesting is a hyperdynamic, hyperdynamic. So maybe it's patient got a uh, important impetus, in, uh, a strong, a strong impetus, have a strong stress. And the case two tells us uh, the patient got a diffuse, the CT scan tells us uh, diffuse ground glass shadow, maybe diffuse the GGO, and, uh, and uh, the long ultrasound indicates uh, the diffuse the B, B, B7, B3 lines, and then the heart indicates a stressed cardiomyopathy. You, you can see, as, well, as uh, can, we can see the patients as, uh, and uh, apical, apical apical balance, balance syndrome, and it's a very, very classical. And then the case three, the patient, the CT scan tells us a large infiltration sheet diffuse, and the uh, long ultrasound tells us it's, it's uh, diffuse beyond pellucid and with uh, pellucid changes. And the patient's uh, almost cause consolidation, but non-gravity dependence. This patient got, uh, uh, and then, and then patient becomes severe and severe, severe, got a severe secondary injury. Patient's lung ultrasound and the CT scan tell us it's a diffuse infiltration and it's a lung and a white lung. The patient, uh, the, the, all, all of the lesion of the lung tell us it's a, have, a, have a tendency of gravity dependency. The patient's echocardiogram tell us, just like this one. Right ventricle enlarged, enlarged, and the septum, septum, and the move, movement is limited. So it's very, 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 very typical and of the uh, ACP acute core pulmonary and uh, is uh, acute uh, pulmonary hypertension. And uh, case four, it's like uh, just like this one tell us uh, CT scan and the lung ultrasound tell us what I mentioned in the last slides, and then. It's a classical, classical ARDS. It's a gravity dependence uh, lesion of the lung injury of the lung. So you can see the echocardiography, uh, echocardiography the uh, features, just like this one, right ventricle, right ventricle enlarged, and the right, right ventricle enlarged, and uh, septum, septum movement limited, uh, indicate a D sign. D sign, you can see the septum, the, the indicated D sign. And there's a case file combined, combined with the typical sepsis bacteria. But uh, you can, you, uh, well, I want to tell everyone, it's reason often is the uh, um, infection prevention and the control is bad. So patient got a bacteria and got a septic shock, you can see a hypo. Hypo, hypo, hypodemic. Totally, the heart is, uh, is uh, totally heart movement is very weak. So you can see the last, uh, the last piece. Heart in recovery, diffuse and high fibers. You can see the heart, the, the lung ultrasound, the lung CT scan, and uh, the lung, lung examine, lung ultrasound tell us the patient uh, got a uh, fibrosis. So you can, we can, we can. Take a echocardiogram exam for a patient. We take a, a name. It's a name. The this heart is a calm heart. 
So because the patient uh, adapt well to the diffuse, mild uh, fibrosis and uh, tolerated uh, tolerated uh, it, and then patient uh, got a uh, got a calm heart. So this is the uh, last uh, slides. I want uh, I want to take a lecture. Uh, the, uh, and then want to tell uh, what would I like to tell everyone about the image, uh, uh, application in management of for critical illness in COVID-19 patients. Image application, CT and the critical sonography, especially combined scenes like CT and uh, lung ultrasound and uh, echocardiography. It's very important. We will name these uh, three key storms. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Wang, for enlightening us on the pathophysiology of COVID-19 pneumonia, as well as emphasizing the importance of a CT scan, uh, ultrasound of the lung, as well as uh, uh, to the echo of the heart in the management of this disease in its various stages. Uh, before we go on to the next lecture, just remind those that may have joined us later that we'll be taking Q&A later after the last presentation. And please submit your questions uh, to the, during the webinar using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Without further ado, please now invite uh, Prof. Prof. Tan Che Heng, Vice President of the Singapore Regulatory Radiological Society and Senior Consultant of the Department of Radiology at Tan Tock Seng Hospital. He will deliver the speech, Clinical Value of Chest Radiograph in COVID-19. Prof Tan, please. Thank you very much, Andrew. And um, thanks to the earlier speakers for sharing. And uh, good afternoon to uh, friends and colleagues. Today, I will share about the role that radiology plays in the clinical management of COVID-19 in Singapore with a focus on the humble chest radiograph. So before I begin, I would like to acknowledge my close colleagues from NCID, from TTSH, as well as the other hospitals during this period. In this lecture, I will briefly cover the status of COVID-19 in Singapore today, the role of imaging in local practice with emphasis on chest X-ray as opposed to CT, and share on the clinical value of chest X-ray in COVID-19, specifically on how it correlates with the lab and clinical markers of severity, as well as its predictive value for severe disease. As of yesterday, there have been more than 17,000 cases of COVID-19 in Singapore. You might have read that we have in the recent two weeks been experiencing a sharp rise in the number of cases, and this is attributable to the proactive detection of isolated contacts with emphasis on quarantine and isolation. Notably, there is a low rate of ICU admissions and deaths directly related to this disease. And to combat this surge in cases, multiple government agencies have come together, together with the private sector, to provide support for patients at different risk and severity levels, ranging from acute hospitals to community care facilities to community recovery facilities. The purpose-built National Center for Infectious Diseases sees the majority of the diagnosed cases. At the screening center and at inpatient settings, chest x-ray is the main imaging modality. CT is reserved for problem solving to look for concomitant diagnoses, such as pulmonary embolism in the minority of patients. To manage the surge in cases, TTSH has converted some of its inpatient facilities to support the national effort. Community care and community recovery facilities have been set up to provide tiered levels of medical care for patients well enough to be discharged for, from medical care but still test positive for COVID. So what then is the role of COVID uh, imaging for COVID in Singapore? Unlike in China where CT scanning uh, has been used 
to complement the diagnosis of the disease uh, with the PCR. All patients in Singapore are diagnosed using swab testing with real-time PCR. The value of imaging is really to identify concomitant chest conditions such as pleural effusions that can compromise the patient's respiratory reserve and serves as part of the criteria to help to decan the well patients out of the acute hospitals into the tiered community care facilities. To illustrate the limitations of CT and chest x-ray, here is a 77-year-old patient who presented with dyspnea and was found to have atypical imaging features of reticular changes in the lower lobes on both chest radiograph and CT, which are more commonly observed in interstitial lung disease. And in, in fact, this was probably uh, considered a false negative on imaging. That said, we had a few cases during this pandemic where the diagnosis of COVID was made incidentally, such as in this patient, for whom CT was performed to investigate abdominal pain, and the lower sections of the lungs were found to contain the typical ground glass opacities uh, in a multifocal distribution uh, that were are reported in COVID. So in either chest X-ray or CT, both uh, modalities, the imaging features are not specific. And so radiologists around the world have responded by categorizing the probability of COVID based on imaging features. I show here an example from the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Radiologists, where the typical findings are multifocal opacities in the lower lobes and peripheries, usually bilateral. Even as typical findings of COVID have been described, it does not mean that these findings are specific. Here are the radiographs of two patients with multifocal mixed haziness and consolidation in the infrahyalur and lower zones of the lungs. The patient on the left had H. influenza pneumonia, while the patient on the right was the COVID patient. To further illustrate the limited specificity of imaging, this was a 75-year-old patient recently admitted for pneumonia and found to have multifocal patchy ground glass opacities, quite characteristic of COVID, but PCR was negative on three, count, three counts and she was discharged well. There is abundant literature at present on CT imaging of COVID much of it from our colleagues from China. CT is reported to be highly sensitive with peak severity observed on day 10 and in a population with high pretest probability like in Wuhan two months ago, this may be very valuable given the lack of PCR test kits. However, imaging and in particular, even with CT, it has untested specificity as I've shown in the earlier cases is logistically challenging to be performed in every patient given that terminal cleaning after each case can take 30 minutes. And it's probably better used for problem solving. I shall elaborate later on the clinical value of chest X-ray. Our local practice of using CT sparingly is aligned to the practice in the health systems of other developed nations in Europe and in the US including the American College of Radiology, which states that CT should not be used as a first-line test to diagnose COVID-19, given that a normal CT test does not mean that a patient does not have COVID-19 infection, and an abnormal CT is not specific for COVID-19 diagnosis. Instead, chest X-ray, especially portable chest X-ray, is recognized for its ease of cleaning to reduce nosocomial transmission. At present, the decision to admit a patient into NCID is based largely on the MOH criteria. For those who do not meet the criteria, but where chest X-ray is indicated and shows pneumonia, the patient is admitted. For those who meet the MOH criteria, significant finding on chest X-ray is one of the criteria for admission. Chest X-ray also forms part of the criteria for discharge from the acute hospital to a community care facility 
And in this example, for patients in early disease, but considered to be at mild risk. Okay, I shall now share the evidence for use of chest X-ray in the management of COVID-19. As we all know, it is probably the most widely used imaging modality for management of the patients during this pandemic. And there is no doubt that the sensitivity of chest X-ray is lower than CT, with only about up to half of patients overall showing abnormalities on chest X-ray. In fact, two-thirds of patients actually present with a normal chest X-ray. This could be because the subtle ground glass opacities that are encountered in the early stage of the infection are not well depicted on chest X-ray. Given that the median time of presentation for our patients in our series is four days from the onset of symptoms. Our findings are not dissimilar to the data from overseas, from Hong Kong and the US. However, with even more proactive screening recently, we are probably going to see an even higher rate of, an, a normal, uh, of normal chest X-rays in our patients, uh, estimated to be up to 90%. In our series, an additional 15% of patients subsequently show chest X-ray abnormalities during the course of their admission with peak severity at nine days from symptom onset. These seem to be greater in the older patients. So given the limitations of imaging described, and in particular for chest X-ray, a low sensitivity for diagnosis, what is the clinical value for chest X-ray? To answer this, we looked at two features. First, does chest X-ray severity parallel disease severity such that we can use chest X-ray to monitor disease? And secondly, is chest X-ray able to predict for patients who will require higher intensity of care? In our pilot study, which we have since validated against a larger cohort, we looked at supplemental oxygen requirement as a clinical endpoint and compared it against the clinical and lab characteristics of each group. Given that chest X-ray carries wide inter-observer variability as a diagnostic modality, we devised a scoring method to quantify chest X-ray severity, which we term the COVID-19 radiographic score, or CRS for short. In CRS, we divided the lungs into six parts and quantified the extent and the density of airspace opacities, which are the predominant imaging abnormalities in COVID. Here is an example of a patient with opacities in the middle and lower zones of both lungs with a cumulative score of 15 based on our assessment. From our study, we found that chest X-ray correlates significantly positively with CRP and LDH, and inversely with lymphocyte count and oxygen saturation. This validates the role of chest X-ray in monitoring disease severity vis-a-vis -vis the lab markers. We further found that the diagnostic performance of CRS correlates with the clinical endpoints of supplemental oxygen requirement as well as or better than the lab markers. This suggests that chest X-ray severity could predict for patients who may require admission for close monitoring. That said, not all chest X-ray abnormalities seem to predict for severe disease. By excluding the patients with very mild or equivocal opacities, we found greater positive predictive value with equally high negative predictive value. Here is an example of a patient who presented with very mild opacities in the left lower zone and who remained stable without the need for oxygen, even with very mild persistent opacities on follow-up. As shared, imaging performed too early in the course of disease does not detect COVID pneumonia. By reviewing the patients who had chest X-ray performed between day 6 and day 10 of symptom onset, we found a sharply higher diagnostic performance of chest X-ray as compared to if it were performed earlier at presentation. Here, a 48-year-old patient who had a normal chest X-ray at day 11 of her disease 
and had a benign clinical cause during admission. Conversely, here was a patient who presented with chest X-ray changes at day five of symptom onset, and then who subsequently required supplemental oxygen. Now, interpreting chest X-ray without the correlation with the patient's clinical features can be risky, given that we know that age and comorbid status, which determine respiratory reserve, are confounders. Here were two patients with similarly very mild opacities in the left lower zone in the initial X-ray, but the older patient on the right required supplemental oxygen subsequently. We can perhaps simplify CRS for translation to clinical routine, given that it is quite a laborious method of scoring, by estimating the proportion of the lungs involved into up mild, which is up to a quarter, moderate, which is up to a half, and severe, which is more than half of the lung fields. And by doing so, we found that we were still able to predict, predict the clinical outcome based on the need for supplemental oxygen or ICU admission. Going by the proportion of the lungs involved, this patient with more than half of his lungs is deemed to have severe disease. And in fact, the patient was intubated in ICU. Now, given the rapid surge in demand for imaging to manage COVID, a number of tech companies have developed AI solutions that claim high accuracy for diagnosis and severity assessment. These are mainly companies from China, such as Ping'an, Alibaba, and Infervision. And their solutions are mainly focused around CT diagnosis and quantification. Locally, to address the use of chest X-ray, a team, a joint team between uh, Tan Tok Seng and ASTAR has set out to validate and test a preliminary model that seems to perform reasonably well with accuracy of between 90 to 96 percent. This is still work in progress, but we hope that our efforts can be used to help our radiologists better manage their work list with a surge in the number of cases. So to summarize, in Singapore, where RT-PCR is still the reference test, there is little role for imaging as the primary diagnostic test for COVID-19. And we know that both CT and chest X-ray have limitations, particularly lack of specificity. And locally, like in many other parts of the world, chest X-ray is preferred for management to reduce nosocomial transmission. And chest X-ray's role, as we have shown through our study, is a marker of disease severity, as well as for triaging the uh, patients who will not need supplemental oxygen or close monitoring and can be managed outside of the acute hospital setting. And finally, I shared briefly that there is potential for AI to enhance the productivity of radiologists for diagnosing COVID pneumonia. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chen Hing, uh, for your talk. Uh, even though chest X-ray is limited, for sharing how uh, Singapore is using chest X-ray both to triage as well as to um, manage patients depending on the severity of the findings. Um, now it's time for the Q&A uh, session. We are with many, I think, are looking forward to. Uh, please remember that you can still submit questions uh, via the Q&A uh, option at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so I'll start with the first question. This first question is uh, related and is directed to uh, Prof. Ha. In Korea, uh, our listeners want to know whether the aggress aggressive testing and social distancing were limited to the hotspots or is it for the entire career? And whether the, the, what was the purpose of the cy cycles of suppression and lift? Whether this is for economic reasons? And how does this impact the healthcare system, Prof? Ha? Uh, actually, I uh, answered with text to uh, each uh, question already. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. yeah uh, first question about uh, the social distancing and massive testing. Uh, 
limit uh, the, 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 the transmission, uh, spread the infection, right? Uh, yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think so. Uh, the first key was uh, only preparation for uh, COVID-19 test kits. That was the key actually. Uh, that uh, enable uh, the government to uh, perform uh, the massive uh, testing and it can uh, allow uh, the contact tracing and that minimize uh, the spread of uh, virus uh, infections. And second question is about uh, the, the, the cycles. The the you, you mentioned at the end of the talk about the the uh, suppress um, like suppress and leave cycles. Yes, yes. Yeah, and and what is the reason for that? Is it is it mainly economic reasons that we want to leave, or or is there any other reason, a medical reason? Uh, so, well, the actually social distancing uh, usually uh, mitigate the uh, number of uh, confirmed cases, right? And uh, but also it will uh, reduce economic activity. So uh, the government surely uh, got press pressure pressure from the uh, national people. So uh, the, the 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 government cannot take uh, just one. Uh, the government uh, have uh, to get a balance between the uh, uh, suppression and uh, lift, right? So uh, that uh, does not influence a uh, healthcare system, but healthcare system can be influenced by that uh, cycle. Which one is it? Uh, because uh, the, uh, the the release easing the social dis uh, distancing can bring more patient to healthcare system. Okay, yeah, that's it. Thank you, thank you. Um, maybe uh, uh, another question um, for uh, Prof Ha regarding uh, the, the use of ultrasound. Um, how does it compare with uh, chest x-ray? Is it, is it more sensitive than uh, a chest x-ray? Actually, that uh, is the fact uh, already have been uh, the proved. Uh, ultrasound, long ultrasound is uh, better, better than uh, X-ray, and it is comparable to uh, CAT scan. <laughs> so uh, the, the 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 ultrasound men who uh, love long ultrasound, uh, they do a lot of long ultrasound. Uh, actually, uh, long ultrasound just uh, look into the lung of the, uh, the, the surface of lung. So uh, there is no summation uh, in uh, chest x-ray. So it could be more uh, accurate, much better than uh, x-ray. Uh, but uh, in case of COVID-19, uh, I like uh, using ultrasound, but uh, in this uh, endemic period, I do not use uh, ultrasound because uh, the, 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 the protocol of uh, hospital uh, do not want uh, the, 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 the contact with patient, <laughs> possible patient <laughs> by uh, medical personnel. So it depends on the situation of each country. Thank, thank you for sharing because we don't really use ultrasound for the lungs so much in Singapore. So we don't have much experience with that. I presume that you use it quite extensively in the ED uh, for, for, this, for these conditions. Thank you. I have some comments about the chest x-ray and the lung ultrasound and the, and the CT scan. <laughs> Because in my in my lecture, I tell well, I want to tell everyone about my my opinion. Maybe everyone is important. Maybe combine the chest X-ray and the lung ultrasound 
and the CT scan is very important, especially in ICO doctor, ICO, ICO department. But in emergency department, uh, there's some special circumstance, circumstance uh, especially in infection prevention and control. But I want to uh, said my tell my opinion about it. maybe X-ray, uh, check X-ray is uh, is very in, in, in difficult to and uh, uh, technically dependent to tell us where's the GGO lesion. So. So in lots of uh, in lots of uh, hospital in emergency department, maybe the C sin, just, uh, just what the professor Holmes said, uh, maybe sin CT scan is a key image, and uh, then in sometimes large round is a is a is a is a technique to tell us what's the lung lesion, but if the patient got a lung lesion. Uh, it's not, it's not a uh, plural attack, plural. But uh, every, as we all know, lung ultrasound uh, looking, uh, looking maybe check the, check the lung, maybe through the plural, the plural. But if the COVID-19 patient's lung lesion is not, is not invaded, invaded the lung, the plural, maybe the lung ultrasound uh, maybe missed a lot of, uh, uh, mild uh, lung lesion. So maybe uh, in the special circum circumstance combined is uh, is a key point. It's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, agree. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So 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 I think I think in both Korea and and, and probably in China, quite a lot of CT scans are are, are being done. Um, how do you manage the infection control aspect of of that? Uh, there was this question whether you use a negative uh, pressure body bags to, to to scan the patient in, or or is there any other? Maybe maybe you can enlighten us. Yeah, uh, I think it's a it's an important problem, important question. Uh, just uh, what you mentioned in the very beginning, in the early stage of the epidemic, maybe we have uh, we. We take a lot of steps, a little steps, uh, a little uh, steps to uh, infection prevention and uh, control. So it's uh, it's very weak, it's very worse. But uh, with the development and with the diagnosis and the recognition uh, development of recognition of COVID-19, uh, in infection prevention and control, and become mandatory and necessary and mandatory. So uh, special CT scan, special room, and a special person. So it's, it's very important, a separated room for CT scan uh, and a, a, a isolated person for CT scan and uh, special doctors for the CT scan reading. It's very important. So, so maybe that's all, thank you. I see. So, so you are saying that you have a dedicated uh, uh, a scanner for the COVID nineteen patients. Is that is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, uh, in Korea, uh, the uh, hotspot where uh, is in Daegu, uh, one of the biggest hospital in Daegu use uh, the negative pressure. Uh, uh, kind of back, uh, they use that a lot. It can be moved to uh, the CAT scan room uh, without uncover the back. So it, the, the, the doctor uh, working over there, it was very useful to uh, bring the uh, sus suspicious patient uh, to the other uh, other uh, other room, uh, such as a uh, cascan uh, cascade room. But uh, thing is, uh, the the some some of that uh, bags uh, cost a lot actually. They <laughs> 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 need a uh, change uh, valve or something like that. So uh, the it cost uh, actually a lot.
That's a thing. Yeah. So I did, yeah. Uh, so we one so, one. And yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, hi, Andrew. Yeah, okay. Maybe I'll ask uh, one question as well. And, uh, and this is because we, we actually don't do very much lung ultrasound uh, in the Singapore setting. And uh, understandably, uh, Professor Wang uh, in the ICU particularly, uh, the question here was, um, how often do you do the lung ultrasound or bedside echo for the ICU patients? Uh, what do you monitor? And uh, how do these changes affect the management of your patients? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good question because uh, uh, in the in the common practice, not the COVID nineteen based epidemic, maybe in I in our our ICU, uh, lung ultrasound is the important part of critical ultrasonography. So maybe the patient got a, a critical scenario. Maybe in the very beginning, uh, in the very beginning, admitting to the ICU for screening and for the monitoring and the command combined the lung ultrasound and the echocardiography, echocardiography is, uh, is, a mandatory, is a necessary and uh, mandatory. So every resident a doctor, maybe the patient in the very beginning admitted to the ICU is the first, uh, is the first situation. And then the second situation about the patient got a critical scenario, just like uh, respiratory failure and, uh, and uh, circulatory compromise, maybe a circulatory, maybe disturbance, and uh, every scenario, patient, uh, the ICU doctor, maybe take a uh, echocardiography combined with the lung ultrasound for the patient and uh, find the exact reason of the critical uh, scenario. And then in the one situation, and the uh, patient, uh, uh, patient in, in, very, in the very beginning uh, admitted to the ICU and uh, take a critical ultrasonography, uh, ultrasonography examination, including lung and ultrasound, maybe some other organ, organ ultrasound, and uh, tell us, uh, tell us uh, the basic uh, situation of the patient and uh, the existing, um, existing cri critical, critical question. And then, and then screen, screen the patient, uh, especially screening the patient's uh, basic situation. So maybe I want to tell you, lung ultrasound is the, is the important part of the critical ultrasonography examination for the ICU patients. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a question for uh, uh, Prof Wang. You mentioned that the heart is involved uh, quite uh, frequently. To what extent um, uh, does it happen? Do they happen with uh, older patients or what's the pattern in, in the cardiac involvement? Mm -hmm. Older patients, what's uh, the... Mm, I, 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 I want to, to, uh, about, to mention about uh, um, in uh, common uh, common words and uh, in a uh, COVID nineteen uh, the, the COVID nineteen um, COVID nineteen uh, pneumonia may be uh, a critical ICU. Uh, that's very very different. The older the older patients is very different in these two two type ICU, especially in COVID critical. Uh, critical COVID-19, uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, criti critical COVID-19 patients world, ICO, ICO wards. There's maybe, um, maybe, maybe one fourth uh, older patients. His, his uh, lung ultra, uh, lung ultrasound and uh, cardiac ultrasound both is very important, but uh, echocardiography examination for these older patients is very important because the patients, uh, if the in old in the older patients, the 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 echocardiography often tell us the patient got uh, uh, the basic uh, the the basic features of the heart, just like uh, 
the diastolic uh, function, dice function, and then valve, valve, just like uh, mitral valve and uh, arter arterial valve, and get uh, get uh, the the older older uh, the older older lesion, just like uh, uh, just like a cal 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 calculation calculation, maybe uh, maybe. Uh, maybe maybe some there's some uh, stenosis and the basic the basic problem and uh, totally the patient got a uh, uh, lighter li left li left arterial left arterial dysfunction and the patient got uh, got a uh, risk to pulmonary edema so these patients the virus pneumonia and uh, combined with uh, the, the high risk of for high uh, pulmonary edema. So both both is a key the key reason to take a echocardiography for the patient in the beginning, especially in the older patients. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the, the, the a question to to Dr. Tan, uh, Prof. Tan, um, because we do a mostly chest X-ray. If 85% uh, were at normal chest x-ray and then they deteriorate, would you then proceed to go on to do a CT scan? Uh, or will you just manage them clinically in, in, in Tan Hospital? Thank you. So um, I, I like to qualify in my earlier response to uh, Stephen. Um, I said that uh, an additional 15% uh, of patients who had who first presented with a normal chest X-ray subsequently developed an abnormal chest X-ray. Um, this 15% is 15% of the entire cohort of patients. Uh, so this actually makes up more than that, but um, that's just for um, being accurate. Um, specifically, if there was a, a reasonably normal chest X-ray, but the patient had uh, clinical signs and symptoms of progressive dyspnea, um, or deterioration, we often would then consider a CT because there would be other causes such as pulmonary embolism that we will want to exclude. And so, yes, indeed, the team would pre proceed to CT. But in our experience, that is a very rare occurrence. Uh, and it is usually, uh, the deterioration is usually accompanied by some degree of chest X-ray abnormalities. The, the, there is a question that asks whether uh, COVID-19 uh, infection is associated with increased risk of thrombosis, uh, whether there is such a relationship. I can I'll open to everybody on the floor. Actually, that uh, is not uh, validated yet. Uh, some uh, European countries and uh, some American doctors uh, talk about uh, th this is important to the COVID-19 patients, uh, but it has not been generalized to uh, other region in each country and to other countries. So, so far I, uh, uh, I, I I never heard uh, about uh, the uh, critical thrombo embolism uh, in COVID nineteen. Uh, it's not uh, uh, it's not uh, the large numbers. I I can uh, the, the, the the large numbers uh, in COVID nineteen. So I'm not sure. But uh, uh, many experts, some experts uh, insist there should be some uh, uh, coagulation problem. But uh, uh, even if there is coagulation problem, uh, there is no uh, uh, validated uh, thera uh, therapeutic option uh, to anticoagulation. So anticoagulation, itself, uh, if the anticoagulation itself will, will be helpful or not, that's not validated yet also. Okay. 
in terms of the um, pattern of infection uh, on CT or ultrasound, is, uh, can we distinguish it, uh, COVID pneumonia from other type of pneumonia? Or, or, or it's actually not possible to, to distinguish? I don't think uh, there, there is a pathognomic uh, sign uh, in any uh, image modality, actually. So uh, Cascade, we know uh, that is uh, high sensitivity, but uh, lower specificity. Actually, ultrasound is similar to Cascade, I think. Uh, chest X-ray, uh, be similar or so. So <laughs> there is no pathognomic finding, but uh, in context of epidemiology and clinical manifestation, the physician should integrate all the information uh, together. So make decision in uh, depending on the, uh, the, 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 the situation uh, in the region. Okay. Um, in our experience, <laughs> Sorry. No, okay, okay. In our experience, we, uh, com maybe the uh, nuclear acid test combined with the CT scan in the very beginning is the key is the key points of, of of the early diagnosis of the COVID nineteen patients, and the ultrasound uh, combined the heart, lung strong, and a lung ultrasound is a key is a key technique to evaluate evaluate the situation of the patients. So I think we maybe, we, maybe we, I wanted to, I would like to tell us, tell us about the, the, the key point about the, uh, how, how often we do the echocardiography for a patient and how important the critical ultrasonography uh, is important for the COVID-19 patients. That's all, thank you. I, I have a question for, for both uh, Professor Wang and Professor Ha. Um, there have been a few of the uh, queries about pediatric patients, and uh, the, we, we do not see much of this uh, in Singapore, and I wonder um, if you could enlighten us on your experience. Uh, for me, uh, no, it's no uh, experience uh, with uh, pediatric COVID-19 uh, cases. Uh, but uh, the uh, Dr. Uh, Lichtenstein, who is known as a uh, father of long ultrasound, he uh, told uh, the even in neonate, uh, we can apply same uh, method to scan the lung. So uh, it could be a similar uh, long ultrasound finding with uh, adult, I think, uh, like B lines uh, presenting uh, interstitial or alveolar interstitial edema. Uh, if the X-ray or CAT scan finding similar to adult. Uh, I'm sure the ultrasound, low ultrasound, is also similar to uh, the, the adult finding. Yeah, I have uh, colleagues, uh, uh, a pediatric uh, doctor, ICU doctor, uh, from Shanghai. He tell us a lot of uh, about long, long ultrasound the play a. Uh, more important role in the COVID-19, especially pediatric patients, because uh, the patient, the the children, maybe the pediatric uh, uh, patients, uh, for these patients, lung ultrasound is uh, is often the only technique to to check the lung of the of the patients and time to time. So it's very important. She said to she tell she tell me. It's a play more role in the pediatric patients. So that's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I would just like to acknowledge a comment by one of our participants uh, that in Singapore, actually, the lung ultrasound is done by our ICU and ED colleagues as part of the critical care ultrasound. And I think this is in relation to the earlier question that I made uh, to Professor Wang about uh, how do you use 
lung ultrasound for monitoring your patients in the ICU. Thank you. Maybe it's a good question, just like what the, the, the last one question you, you asked me. Um, in, the, <laughs> in the very beginning, me, I, and the, the Professor Hong Yun, we take part in the WinFocus uh, team to, to training the trainer, training the trainee all over the world, especially Asia. So maybe in the future, we will take lots of work, take of job to push forward the launch round in the whole ICU world, maybe, uh, maybe in emergency department. So I promise, <laughs> thank you. But I, I wanted to say launch round is only one part, one part of the critical ultrasonography. Every ICU doctor would, should, should, um, and uh, should, um, should have the should 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 be the expert in critical ultrasonography. Maybe critical ultrasonography play an important role for the lots of SEO doctor, SEO doctors and uh, SEO patients. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Thank you. It's same to oh, immune okay. physician. <laughs> Not only uh, <laughs> intensivist, the immune physician should use a uh, long ultrasound. Actually, the uh, I call that a uh, multi organ POC ultrasound. It includes uh, not only lung, but also heart and abdomen, uh, vessels. So we scan all of them. Uh, actually, the emergency fusion use the use POC ultrasound more in differential diagnosis uh, and stabilization. But uh, uh, intensivists use uh, pure shoulders are more for monitoring, right? So uh, it, it's similar, but uh, in some aspect, uh, different aspect we have <laughs> each other. <laughs> I agree, I agree. Lung ultrasound uh, monitoring the lung uh, is a routine, necessary, and a mandatory. So, <laughs> it's, yes. Yes. so thank you, it's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have one correct question from our clinical colleagues uh, directed to Prof. Uh, Wang. Any experience in the use of pulmonary uh, vasodilators in the ICU patients with evidence of uh, acute core pulmonary use of vasodilators? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, uh, I, I, I wanted to tell, uh, I want to, would like to tell us about this information. Uh, especially COVID-19 patients have some special characteristic, but the, the basic import, important is the high, high, uh, it's a respiratory failure from the, from, uh, from the virus pneumonia, and then uh, severe hypo, hypoxonia and the severe uh, acute uh, um, respiratory failure. Uh, from the uh, ARDS, it's a key. It's a key two reason. One is uh, virus pneumonia, and the second one is uh, ARDS. So I I would like to tell everyone about the acute pulmonary embolism. Is rare, is rare. But 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 because COVID nineteen patients is very very severe, and. Uh, and uh, the onset of uh, APE of the COVID-19 uh, patients may be a little more than the common ICU patients. It's my, it's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, uh, Prof. Wang, you mentioned that, that in, the, in the treatment, in the face of the disease, there are actually therapy-related injury as well. Are there any advice mm. on how we can minimize uh, this uh, sort of injury? Uh, because for the yeah. severe patients, I think their survival is, is dependent on that. Yeah. Uh, just like the Professor Gattinoni from the Italy, 
from a, a, a worldwide uh, famous doctor about uh, his, uh, his emphasis is on the ARDS study and ARDS uh, uh, clinical, uh, clinical treatment. Uh, just like he said, maybe how to differentiate uh, the, uh, the why there's pneumonia and ARDS. So, so in, my, uh, in, in my appearance, a uh, lot of common ICO common 19 patients in the early stage of the patients, maybe wife's pneumonia is the main reason of lung injury. And then with the pro progression of the disease uh, from the sick to the sickest patients, lots of patients got a secondary lung injury. Uh, the main reason, uh, there's lots of, uh, lots of pain, pain, lots of uh, maybe, um, lots of reason. Maybe uh, this time uh, in the duration of the COVID-19 patients, uh, lots of experts, experts, pay more attention to the self self inflicted lung injury because in the very beginning patients uh, maybe a uh, uh, lot of experts ignore the patients the uh, 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 the di 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 regulation uh, dysfunction of maybe the uh, abnormal reaction of the body patient uh, uh, for the for the hypo uh, hypoxia hypoxia so the patient's uh, uh, strong respiratory driver and uh, had got a, a very, very severe respiratory distress, maybe very, very strong uh, respiratory driver, maybe makes a secondary lung injury. So maybe it's the main reason. Uh, in the later stage of the epidemic, lots of uh, a uh, lot of uh, uh, SEO experts maybe agree with my opinion, with uh, Gatinov's opinion for this. That's my, that's, that's my opinion. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I think we have come to, to almost to the end of the Q&A session uh, because the time, I think we have passed the time by, by 10 minutes. Uh, thank you for taking the extra time. Um, maybe to, to conclude, if one of you can give the last tip for the audience on what to do in this uh, COVID-19 situation, then, then uh, we'll take turns. Um, yeah. So we start with uh, Prof Ha. Uh, as an emergency physician, uh, I have been working in a tough situation. Actually, the number of patients uh, visiting emergency department is not quite high. It's actually lower than before. But uh, we need to separate the patients uh, who are in uh, infectious disease and non-infectious disease. Uh, and we need to change the clothes <laughs> and uh, for <laughs> PPE. <laughs> And uh, the, the other department does not uh, give, uh, does not admit the patient unless the uh, patient PCR test reveal negative to protect hospital, right? So uh, uh, as an immunized patient, it's very tough uh, to work. But uh, we don't know when this uh, situation will end. So uh, I think well, until the uh, uh, effective drug or vaccine show up, uh, we need to work uh, more. We should admit that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's all. Mm. Uh, Prof. Wang, any advice? Last tip yeah. before we close? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Give me another chance to tell something. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with, uh, with a detailed uh, application of uh, imaging from the CT scan and uh, 
and uh, and uh, maybe the large round, maybe the critical ultrasound, round, and uh, and I, I think uh, uh, we we will have lots of uh, knowledge, and we will have the enrichment of the of the understanding of the COVID nineteen. So maybe we will win. We will win. We will win. Thank you. Thank you for the positive message. Uh, lastly, Cheng, any message? Yeah, I, I just like to, to highlight uh, one point about uh, imaging, which is that um, it is indeed a uh, multiple modalities and they are all technically complementary, each with their strengths and limitations. And in using these modalities, I think it is important for uh, both the referring physician as well as the radiologist to be aware of how these uh, limitations can affect the patient's treatment uh, or decision making. And uh, the management of COVID patients must be multidisciplinary. And I'm really glad that today we have uh, with us uh, physicians from different fields coming together uh, to discuss how to best uh, diagnose as well as monitor the patients. And thank you everyone for your uh, hard work during this period. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, speakers, for taking the time to share your, your experience with us. Okay, we have now come to the end of the uh, webinar, and I we hope the audience have uh, enjoyed and benefited from the discussions. Uh, before we close, um, I would like to invite uh, Prof Tan Che Heng, Vice President of Singapore Radiology Society, to deliver some closing remarks. Prof Tan. Yeah. Thank you. And I've already spoken a lot. So just a big thanks once again to our overseas speakers, uh, Professor Ha and Professor Wang. Uh, it has been a very engaging and informative session. And thank you to all the participants for all your uh, queries as well. And we hope that you have all enjoyed the seminar and wish everyone a great weekend ahead. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank thanks you. a lot. Bye-bye.